thank you so much for joining us for this first session of the day. We're really pleased we're going to be talking, um, discussing the role of quality. Can we keep it at the forefront of humanitarian assistance? And I think at the, the way the world is right now, this is, could not be a more timely and critical debate. Should quality be still central to our response in humanitarian assistance when we're under such pressure to meet unprecedented demands and needs? Um, we have an excellent panel here to discuss this issue with you, but we do want this to be a discussion, so we're looking forward to having um, a two-way conversation with all of you in the room on this issue. Um, but to kick us off and open the show, I'm delighted to welcome William Anderson, who's the Executive Director of Sphere, who's going to give us, set the scene a bit of Sphere's role around quality for the last 25 years and where it sees the landscape now. So, William, very much welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Jess, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone being in the room, and thank you very much to everyone being online as well. So, good morning. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge just how difficult humanitarian assistance is. And first and foremost, we're working with people at maybe the worst time of their lives, who are in shock, who are in trauma, in grief, in loss, and we're working in disorder. And humanitarians are very often unwelcome and increasingly and illegally targeted. Humanitarians on the front line in many places around the world put their own lives on the line. Now, my role now is a lot easier than it was. I'm now based in Geneva, as before I was on emergency response teams, trying to make sense of chaotic situations. But even here, working in Geneva, I'm struck how much more difficult we make it for ourselves the competition we have with ourselves, the politics, the too long acceptance of toxic leadership. And we are much quick, quicker to criticize other agencies than we are to praise them. And what I'd, like to speak in, what I'd like to speak into now is just how confusing we make it for ourselves in our terms, in our concepts, in our language, and for others outside the sector looking in, how difficult it is for them to understand it. And we assume so much, and we often make judgments based on those misconceptions. So we're setting ourselves up to fail too often. We're failing sideways, we're failing backwards, we're not failing forwards nearly enough. And we keep saying we are not fit for purpose. And you know what, people? outside the sector, maybe donors, but the people we work with might actually start to believe us. And one of the ways we complicate our work is the four core humanitarian principles. Humanity, humanitarian imperative, and impartiality, fundamentally ethical values. But impartiality is also an operational tool. And neutrality and independence are operational and they're organizational. They're not individual moral values at all. And impartiality, if you look it up in the dictionary and talk to a journalist, well, they'll say it's neutrality. Neutrality is all about equitable distribution, which means targeting particularly the most vulnerable. And it means about distinguishing those who are in most need of assistance. So we're setting ourselves up to fail when we don't fundamentally understand these. So five years ago, I was in Mozambique. I was on the first plane into Pemba after Cyclone Kenneth, talking with someone from Ocha, who's here today. And, he, and we were both agreeing that neutrality and independence are operational. They're pragmatic. And yet he was saying his head office and his colleagues keep saying, no, no, they're the four core. We can't even talk about them being in end of any individual definition. Ethiopia, three years ago, um, when NRC was shut down by the government, um, other agencies too frightened and often hiding behind the principle of neutrality. And then in Odessa, two years ago, I was speaking with the deputy mayor of Odessa about neutrality and explaining it's an organizational approach, not an individual moral decision. And this week, yesterday, I looked up, um, there's a membership principle of another agency, and it says the principles that we have to comply with the principles. Well, we don't. We have to endeavor to, we have to try to, 
but we have to compromise on neutrality and independence. So operating in that gray area is absolutely critical. And if we don't have a fundamental understanding of that as aid workers on the front line, as staff in capital office and head office, then we're already setting ourselves up to fail because we're not free to talk about the fact that we have to compromise. So we tie ourselves in knots. And the principle of do no harm. Well, Mary Anderson took this um, from the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. And she didn't mean it to become this absolute value because of course we can't do no harm. We simply can't. The fact that we're all, all in this room together there's been some little bit of harm done to something, maybe the environment, to get us here. We can't do no harm. So it's a stretch to take that Hippocratic Oath, which is an oath between the doctor and the patient, an individual personal relationship, to a project, a program, or a whole sector. So we can't, so we're, again, we're setting ourselves up to fail when we say these are absolute values that we must hit. And then we use words like localization, which mean everything but actually means nothing because do we talk about localization as locally led or do we talk about localization as a plug-in and play global system nexus which literally means binding together it has a nuance but it's not fundamentally different to dmp to drrr to lrrd to resilience to early action to anticipatory action to preparedness it's not fundamentally different it's all about pre, during, and post. And of course we work with communities to support them in their recovery, preparing for a possible next event. And yet we keep thinking up new paradigms, new phrases, new concepts to enable us maybe to try and talk to donors who might then release some funds because we've got this new phrase when we're talking about the same thing. So again, we're, we're making it harder for ourselves And then the environment. There was an uh, HPN ODI headline in February, and it said, um, humanitarians still haven't agreed what they should do about climate change. And it's true, we haven't agreed, but we have to agree. As we know, there is no planet B. So we need to get to that agreement very quickly. And that brings me to my final point. So the humanitarian charter and principles. The humanitarian charter and principles are like a compass. The standards, you can compare them to like a map. But to get anywhere, we need to choose the appropriate vehicle, whether it's on foot, on a bike, by horse, by car, by plane. In other words, context. And context is absolutely key to all the humanitarian standards in the partnership, all the guidance. And in some ways, the Sphere Handbook is like an Atticus Finch moment, for it lays out if we were in their shoes, how would we like to be treated? What assistance, what level of quality of assistance would we expect? And Sphere and the other humanitarian standards in the partnership, we're not rule books. We're not calling out people or agencies if they're not able to reach those standards, not at all. They're guidance documents to help, not hurt. To help not hinder. And the standards are qualitative and they're universal and they're not controversial. I'm going to read out a couple of standards now. So I'm reading it directly from the book so you know I'm not making it up. So WASH 3.2, people have adequate, appropriate and acceptable toilets to allow rapid, safe and secure access at all times. It's qualitative. There's no indicator attached to that. The indicator, the key indicator, and the key actions have to be contextualized. And that's not controversial either. Nor, for example, food assessment standard 6.1. The basic nutritional needs of the affected people, including the most vulnerable, some might argue especially the most vulnerable, are met. The basic nutritional needs of affected people are met. Not controversial at all. Not a, not a high horse rule book but guidance to help. And each standard is be, to be contextualized. So in extremely challenging contexts, that standard may not be reached, may not be reached for a week, a month, a year, 
10 years perhaps. But this, this does not mean the humanitarian standards, the sphere handbook are irrelevant. In fact, it's the opposite because it's saying someone somewhere is making the decision to deny people their human right, their human right to live with dignity. So it's actually designed and can only be used as contextualized. And it can be held up in a, as an aspirational sign in Gaza, in Sudan, in Myanmar, and possibly even in DPRK, the North Korea. The aspirational size sign that says, we believe in and respect your dignity, and this is where we want to be, and this is where we want to join you now on your journey to get there. So just finally then, in 10 years time, I'm quite convinced, as hard as it is to say, we're gonna look back to 2024 and say humanitarian assistance was easier then, easier in 2024, due to the worsening external factors, the increased conflict, the severity, the scale, the scope of natural disasters, man-made often, pandemics, unaccountable state leaders, unaccountable state leaders making terrible decisions and cybersecurity and so on and so on. You know, you know, all know the challenges in the context. So I think it's gonna be even worse in the days to come, which is why we must simplify and harmonize and get on the same page about the concepts and the terms that we use so that we're better prepared as a sector to face the challenges. And humanitarian standards are like a lighthouse. We're not a threat but we're a safeguard, we're a torch bearer, and we're a guide. Because if we give up on quality, then we are giving up on dignity. And if we lose our intent or our respect to uphold dignity, we are no longer humanitarian, and therefore definitely not fit for purpose. Thank you very much, and I'm gonna hand back to Jess now. Sorry. One more thing, I did say we're gonna have quality snacks, so I'm now gonna, we're gonna pass them around. Anyway, over to Jess. Always important to start with the snacks, William. Well, thank you, uh, what a powerful opening for us. William said, we are tying ourselves in knots. So that is the challenge for our lovely panel today is to help us untangle that knot a little bit and think seriously about the role of quality in, in the world today of delivering humanitarian assistance. Um, the astute among you might have noticed I've got a bit of a sore throat and that's kind of ideal for a chair. It means I'm going to try and not speak too much and give the floor to my panellists. Um, so you won't hear too much after my introductions. But let me introduce my panel now. Uh, on my, my far left, we have Vanda Lenkong. Vanda is the Regional uh, Head of Disaster Risk Management for Plan International Asia Pacific. She's a professional humanitarian worker with more than 20 years experience in the sector. And she oversees the portfolio of humanitarian work, disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and school safety across 15 countries in the region. And she also promotes a gender transformative approach in disaster risk management work. Next, no, next to me is Anna. Anna Pinto de Oliveira, sorry Anna, <laughs> is a public health doctor holding a master's degree in microbiology and a PhD in international health. Anna has extensive experience in public health, epidemiolo I can never say it. epidemiological <laughs> surveillance, <laughs> health planning, and working with vulnerable populations. She is an independent humanitarian action consultant with experience in Portuguese speaking countries, and she's also a consultant to the World Health Organization's technical group on immunization for the African region. So, welcome, Anna. On my, on my right here, we have, excuse me, Alpha Kachuk. And Alpha is the Director General for International Affairs and Migration, Migration Services at the Turkish Red Crescent and is in charge of the organization's international relations, humanitarian programs and refugee and migration services globally. Just a small job, Alpha. <laughs> he, uh, he's also serving as the President of Sphere. Alpha has worked for more than 15 years in the humanitarian field, predominantly with the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and the United Nations. And then finally, but not least, is Juliet Parker. And Juliet Partner is ALNAP's director. She's responsible for working with the ALNAP secretariat to coordinate ALNAP's strategy and ensure its coherence and implementation across the globe. Juliet has 20 years experience of humanitarian program and senior level strategic management in NGOs, 
with a particular focus on performance and monitoring, evaluation and accountability and learning. Welcome, Juliet. So that's our panel, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to kick off with a bit of a challenging uh, question for our panel. So we heard from William that uh, we're often, the sector's often challenging itself to say we're not fit for purpose. And I think we need to really question and make sure that we're, we're convinced of the role of quality within the system of today and the future. Given the reality that we're all facing today with extreme pressure on the humanitarian system and, and escalating needs, do you not think it would be better and more practical to at least drop the minimum standards principle and instead adopt a do what we can, when we can, where we can approach? What would it be like if we simply allowed the agencies that are responding with the room to make their own decisions on operational standards? Surely this would be a more honest and ethical approach, more transparent with the reality of decision making today, rather than setting ourselves up to a level of quality, which, as William says, we often feel that we're failing to meet. So that's our first question for my panel. And I'm going to ask Anna to take on to respond first. Anna, over to you. So good morning, everyone. I want to start by thanking to William and Felicity for the invitation, to all my colleagues uh, in the table and everyone in the room and online. Uh, so I have a bias, right, because I'm a professor in a medic medicine school, so maybe I'll talk a lot of health, okay? So I think that universities are an excellent setting for empowering students, teachers, parents, local and uh, international community. So um, one of the biggest roles are the contribution of the studies as a first step towards a more systematic and sector-wide understanding of healthcare governance uh, in humanitarian crisis. So by surveying practices um, relating to healthcare or the current policies. But um, I think we have two challenges. So, the first one is we have to assume that quality of care seems to be not only difficult to define, but also not easy to measure, right? And we have this, we think about quality in Western countries, but not so much in low income countries, right? And then definitely it's a challenge in humanitarian context, right? So this is confirmed by literature. Uh, Shu and colleagues tell us this, this. In disaster settings, ensuring quality of care is extremely challenging. So in healthcare and the quality, quality of health care, we have two, six domains, six crucial domains that we have to think about. The safe, the effective, the patient centers, mm -hmm. uh, the timely, the efficient and the equitable. So we have to do it this in healthcare, but this is a challenge in healthcare in humanitarian settings, right? And then um, by my field work and my class work, um, I have one of the biggest challenge that uh, I saw um, to bring this topic to the classroom. So this is really important. Um, I, I left here two questions for the room and for the, the others, that if it is, it is ethical justified to send medical students abroad to research, to resource scarce settings in the first place, and then what happens if this, the guidelines say something different? So if they say definitely that medical students should not perform a certain procedure, procedure during these electives that they do, right? Because uh, is any help better than no help? So I left this question to all the people here in the room. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. It's a great question. And I think we could spend the whole morning discussing yes. that one, the ethics of sending people up to practice. Um, Vanda, you are involved in a lot of live operation response right now. Well, how does it feel to you in terms of the reality of delivering quality through your work? Okay, thank you, Jess. And first of all, thank you to Secretariat for uh, inviting me for this uh, panel. So yeah, I'm a living evidence in using the standard. So uh, William, if you are asking whether, you know, I personally believe the add value of the humanitarian standards 
the sphere, the core humanitarian standard, the minimum standard for child protection, uh, education in emergency, the market analysis, it's been used, no? And I personally uh, I use it. So I'm also uh, confident to say that I'm practitioner in, in basically uh, using the standard in my real work in different deployment that I've uh, been sent by my organization from Plan International. So for me, the humanitarian standards are crucial in the sector, first of all, because as we are all know that the standard is basically aiming for equality and accountability for all the work that we, uh, we do. And it is not only, people always said accountable to the donor. For me, the other way around, we need to be accountable to the people that we serve because they have the right to be served with dignity. That's the whole aim of the humanitarian uh, standard. And of course, to the donor and to our own organization. For me, the standard is there for a reason. I believe those founding fathers, founding mothers who basically develop all the standard, we know all the history behind. However, I think when we are talking about 2024, as, as, Christia, as William said, as well as uh, Jess said, Maybe the humanitarian system as of now is not fit for purpose because it is, there is a growing, there is a growing need. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, also uh, encouragement to the community in terms of participate meaningfully into the humanitarian work. And sometimes as, as humanitarian actor, we think that we are the superwoman or superman organization. We are not. We are supposed to really you know, engage and involve the, go the community and then people that we serve, including the young people. So I think we need to think differently when we are discussing about this, um, uh, this topic and also not forgetting that when we talk about minimum standard, it's minimum standard from by who? You know, we also need to think through about how the government buy in uh, into the whole minimum standard. Minimum standard in Asia Pacific may be not the same with minimum standard in the situation in Gaza or the situation in, in Ukraine. So I think it really needs to be uh, think through uh, properly and comprehensively uh, around, around this. Um, but for me, I mean, in Asia Pacific uh, region, I can able to uh, witness that there is a lot of a growing buy-in from different organizations, including the national uh, civil society in using the standard in their work because at least there is a guidance out there that they can able to use, which of course need to be contextualized in the different contexts. So uh, Anna also mentioned how to engage the university, the student become very important because they are the future, no? In the next uh, 10 years time. So Plan International is one of organization that we also really continue to promote all the standard. And I second what William said, Collaboration is become important. That's why the humanitarian standard partnership, I think now uh, being continued to be promoted. So when we are going out there, it's not only about sphere. It's not only about child protection minimum standard or INEE, but we mentioned about humanitarian standard partnership is a platform of all of the different standards that people can able to use. And we are coordinated. So we are not only uh, you know, promoting one uh, better than the other. Of course, the core humanitarian standard as well. And I think moving, moving forward, this is something that uh, just I believe that we need to do more um, in the sense of really uh, bringing the participation of uh, the people, uh, the affected people, the community that we serve, bringing university, young professional, we need to really kind of like work closely with them but also making sure when we use the humanitarian standard, it is always need to be contextualized with the local context because minimum standard is there as a guidance that need to be also looking into the growing of the humanitarian need, right-based approach. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Vanda. And I'm going to come back to you later with a question on that. But that was great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to shift to my other side now. Juliet, um, leading ALNAP, you recently uh, launched the, the State of the Humanitarian System Report, which is such an important report for our sector. And I think within that, you document some encouraging progress, but a lot of stalling as well. What do you think in terms of the role of quality in relation to the performance of the system? Are we setting the bar too high uh, for what we can really achieve? Hmm. So I think, 
It really, I think it really depends on too high for what. And, and like, what's the risk of setting it too high? If the risk is that we may not achieve it, is that a good enough reason for us to then reduce the, quali the um, height of the standard? And that all depends on how we use the standard and the intention of the standard. It's been a nice opportunity actually for me to go back to some of these standards and some of the debates around standards, is that one of the things I was reminded of is that the actual articulation of the standard is an output of a whole collection of other processes that are actually really, really important. And what I was reminded of was the importance of contextualization. And as a sector, we can struggle with that. We are a sector that was built for speed and scale. And that means that we will always feel attracted to the kind of one size fits all blanket approach. And where we are in the sector at the moment, of course, is struggling to reconcile that speed and scale business model that we have with our desire and need and commitment for contextualization and customization, which we can't quite manage. And that's where the frustration lies. What we've seen looking at the state of the humanitarian system report and lots of other reports is actually the technical sector specific learning curves are nice. We're getting better at WASH, we're getting better at nutrition, where the sticking points are, are on these ugh ones, the localization one, the nexus one, uh, and the accountability to affected populations, which, is, which are all the ones that are about context and judgment, I think. Um, a few points that I think also come out of the kind of standard setting process. One is the importance of collective approaches. We, in ALNAP, we're looking currently at the um, revising the guidance for the OECD DAC criteria for use in humanitarian evaluation. And one of the things that, that you realize is the, the importance of a collective conversation in order to bring people together to discuss and, you know, and disagree and agree on actually what appropriate standards are. And unless we have that collective conversation, unless we have that collective agreement, we don't really know what each other are talking about. Um, which means that our collective action, which is what humanitarianism is about, then loses something very important. The other is the value of the conversation itself. I noticed William used the word toxic leadership, which I thought was nice, tastily strong comment to put in there. But the way that our system is set up is skewed towards incentivizing organizations to prove why what they're doing is good, rather than to question why what they're, they're doing is good, which from a learning perspective is a massive inhibitor. Setting standards and having those conversations when it's done well can create spaces by which organizations are prepared and able to be transparent about their learning in order to contribute to a greater collective knowledge and learning, which is really important. In ALNAP, we would say that we need to do a lot more to increase and diversify the number of safe learning spaces within the humanitarian sector. And these conversations are an excellent example, as well as opportunities to cultivate the culture of quality. We can set any number of standards as we, as we want, but unless there, is, there are organizational cultures that are committed to quality and committed to learning and improvement, then it won't happen. And this in itself is also important. I have lots of other comments, but maybe I've spoken, maybe I can say one more. <laughs> it's around measuring quality. So in our lab, we talk a lot about how to measure things. And, and I think this is where uh, standards struggle. So we know from looking at the State of the Humanitarian System report, we're really good at counting things, but we're not very good at counting and measuring outcomes. And I think that too much counting of activities and participants and not enough um, uh, focus on outcomes already compromises our ability to critique and understand the quality of interventions. And that's a sector-wide um, issue, though we do know that in some sectors we're better at it. For example, cash is starting to have really good evidence of outcomes, but you know, protection's still struggling. So it's also, actually, we need to use this opportunity of talking about standards also to look at the differences between our sectors. And the first, last final point I'll make is about who defines quality. And this is really important. And what keeps coming out, and it came out in our State of the Humanitarian System report, is that often communities affected by disasters will have quite different understandings and expectations around what we mean by quality, and they aren't always well matched with our humanitarian definitions. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for bringing up evidence. <laughs> it's really important. Um, 
Alpha, I know that you have been incredibly stretched for the last few years responding to huge crises across the Turkish earthquake, Syria response, um, and now obviously Gaza as well. Do you think with the Red Crescent, quality is an important principle that you're really striving towards? Or are you having to face reality and adopt a less demanding approach towards quality? Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Yes and no. Yes to the question of if whether we put quality as a priority or not, that is a yes and no. If we are giving up from quality, no, we, we don't. But <clears throat> I want to first say acting in quality is a choice. And I think it's a choice that we need to keep in our response. We should not give up from that. The world is testing and challenging us to see whether we will give up. But as William also said, I truly believe that it is a key uh, approach to maintain and protect the dignity of individuals that we serve. And it, it keeps us around the way that we serve as we want to be served. I think the quality, <clears throat> the Red Cross of Death and Family you mentioned, yes, we work around the world with a big family uh, which is called as Red Cross Red Crescent Family, which has 192 members around the world. And we have a preset uh, frameworks and ways and processes, mechanisms to work in quality. And we want to keep that updated to the realities of the day so that we can continue to serve in quality. It's a movement that is now 160 years old. And by keeping the quality at the center of its work. I think it's one of the reasons how it kept itself alive for 160 years. Sometimes we're mentioned as a conservative moment, but there are reasons behind. We have, for example, today we're working in Gaza. We're working in Syria, you mentioned. We had our devastating earthquake of the century in Turkey last year. The way these methods that we did preset, considering the quality at the center, uh, keeps us as a family and we know there's a similar partner in that country who acts in that same quality framework. We have identified ways, principles, methods to work with one another. So it's, it's, it's extremely helpful to know in our network that you have a similar partner who acts on the same lines with you and in, in quality. Let's, let's think about for a second, I think we have quality standards, we have quality processes, we have quality layers in our programming. We assess, we plan, we deliver, we monitor, we adjust, we learn and do better. I can't even think of a, a, a moment that we don't do this and we just concentrate on the process of delivering. And yes, the way is uh, today, the world is testing us, it's challenging us to drop things and go and often airdrop things and go mm -hmm. and don't even engage with the communities. Yes, that's how it goes, but we cannot give up because it's harder and it's becoming harder. Earthquake in our country last year and context, many of the panelists mentioned about context. Yes, we will need to adjust depending on the context and we will deliver the quality standards as, as the situation allows, but keeping that at the center of our design thinking and programming, I think is, is is the way that it can rise when the minimum uh, conditions allow that to happen. In Karaman Marash earthquake, could my organization follow the sphere handbook and its guidance and its standards, key indicators? Yes, the situation was more conducive. We could follow more or less all the indicators in all sectors. But in Gaza, we just woke up to a morning today in a tra tragic, after a tragic night in Gaza where all the border crossings that are lifelines to Gaza are, are closed now. We have a ship on its way to Gaza. Now we are struck, I mean, we are challenged with what to do with all this cargo because the border is closed. And in Gaza, after 1.5 million people are now living in a, in a place where actually there were 250,000 people, how to follow the shelter standards where, that we set, we, where we aim three to five meters square per person closed shelter area where you don't have even one meter square for people. But it doesn't mean that we will give up. Often we use this 
as an advocacy tool. Because I was just, in all the interviews or all the engagements for reasons of humanitarian policy we do, sphere standards and the key indicators are strong ammunitions or arguments for me to make. I was saying last week in an interview that people don't even have one meter square, they need to have at least five. That comes from the standards. If, if those standards were not there, and all these are minimum standards which we all consulted and agreed together. I think it's important that we should not be disappointed as a sector if we don't meet the key indicator that we did set together. It will come up when the situation allows, but it is a strong advocacy tool for in our work and we should not give up because it is becoming harder to meet them. That's uh, more or less what I can say on this. Thank you and such powerful examples of the challenges. I uh, really appreciate that, Alpa. I'm going to give the audience a chance on this question. If you have any particular questions about the role of, of quality in current response, please uh, raise your hand and I'll take a few for the panel. Um, if not, I have some that are burning myself, which I'm very keen to ask, but I'll give the floor to you first if any of you would like to ask a question. A one online, William, is it? Do you want to? Okay, I'll go for the online question first. Thank you. Um, will there be changes in sphere standards regard, regarding changing climate conditions? And will new information regarding nutrition standards in disasters and emergencies be included in the guide? So, yeah, this is the only question so far online, and I've, I've asked it because I can answer it quite easily <laughs> while you're thinking in the room. So, a, a plug for tomorrow morning. Um, yes. Uh, the next edition of the handbook will be even more environmentally conscious than it is now, and it is at the moment, just in the same way as the new core humanitarian standard um, included more on the environment and climate change as well. So there's a session tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on nature-based solutions, and Sphere has an unpacked guide, which was very kindly worked with the IUCN and IFRC on this guide, so absolutely. And last week I met with, well, I was at the Global Nutrition Cluster meeting about three weeks ago, and then I met with the, one of the coordinators, Stefano Fideli, um, last week. And yes, absolutely, there is um, a need and a consensus that we need to update the nutrition standards. Um, so yeah, that will be coming. Um, probably we'll be able to do it online before we can have it in print, but yes. Okay, so that was nice, easy. Uh, questions for me to answer. Now back to you, Jess. Thank you. I'm, was there a question? For, did you see? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a uh, lightning uh, session. So I would like to ask, um, William also mentioned, um, if we lose the quality, we will also lose the dignity. So what is the navigation way for us in the nearest uh, nearest uh, position uh, to, to do U-turn to catch up the quality if we are seeing we are losing the dignity. So what is the, what is the way to understand this? We are at the wrong way. Thank you. Almost wrong. Thank yeah. you, Brad. I'll Thank take you. a couple from the floor. Is anybody else? Um, and then the panel can choose anybody else. Otherwise, I have, a, I have one for um, Pravanda and William. Um, Vanda, you mentioned particularly that minimum standards in Asia might be very different from minimum standards in Ukraine or in, in Gaza. So what does that mean for actors like Sphere in your mind? How do they create a, a panel? We just told we'll have a few questions because we also have the lady from there. Um, and Anna, your role is very much involved in the teaching around it. In most professions, you see quality is, is progressing through evidence and learning. And, and Julie also mentioned a lot around learning. What do you see the role of the, the research set in improving the understanding about the contextualization of, of standards and practice? Is there an active role for, for research in that area? Um, so yes, any panels, the question of dignity, dignity sorry, and how we, how we kind of balance that. Um, and the question of what's the role for actors like Sphere with different minimum standards and the question on research. Thank you. Thank you for the question on dignity. Yeah, and it's really important. I think what's important as well is just to take, take a step back. Whose primary responsibility is it to provide assistance, provide protection, provide security, 
It's the state or it's the government or it's the de facto authority. Now, when um, the state or the de facto authority is not able to provide it, then by international humanitarian law should come humanitarian assistance, either be given access, unimpeded access. Now, if, if in those really difficult situations in Gaza, in Sudan, in Myanmar, um, we cannot reach quality minimum standard in a certain period of time which we consider acceptable, that's not to say we're throwing dignity out at all, because we always have the intent, just like Alpa said just now, we always have the intent to reach there. But if we give up that intent, then I think we're giving up on dignity. Yeah, so it's the approach. Okay, I can follow up, Jess. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, quickly on that one, I think on the dignity, I always believe uh, that's why the importance of consult uh, with the, 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 the people we serve, no? with boys, girls, uh, um, adults, even, you know, we are talking about intersectionality uh, as well in, in humanitarian assistance, so it becomes important because the dignity to, to the people, so it's important for, for it. Now come to Jess, um, I think minimum standard is a global minimum standard, no? we have the sphere handbook that been used uh, uh, globally. But what my point uh, uh, before is basically linking on how the minimum standard been contextualized in each of different contexts. For example, in, 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 in Myanmar, because I'm coming, uh, I've been deployed to Myanmar as well. I mean, providing 7.5 to 15 liters of water in, in, in the specific context in the Rohingya uh, um, situation, it become, become um, a little bit difficult during, during uh, uh, that time. But of course, we will not saying that we we should uh, provide less than less than uh, the standard. No, we need to do to do more of it. Meanwhile, perhaps in in Ukraine, even though it is a war situation, but in terms of the infrastructure, I mean, having five seven point five or fifteen liters of water, it become more easier compared to the context in um, uh, in Myanmar, for example. I've been in the influx uh, 2017. Uh, I've been there three days uh, after, not even three days, two days, when all the um, almost 750 people right away in Cox's Bazar. It's very, very difficult. And even as humanitarian worker at a time, and I'm still chill, I'm questioning the standard itself. Because even my organization and others, we don't know how to support suddenly 750 people in the front of you. And then Cox Bazar, for those who've been to Cox Bazar, it's not really huge, no? And people like everywhere, every corner, there are people. And even you cannot, you cannot, you cannot help. So I think it's more on how the minimum standard is being contextualized, but in the sense of the, 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 the guidance, that's why we have the standard, uh, sphere standard, um, and the other standard is basically there for the guidance, but more on how it is contextualized and which is, might be different from one context to another context. Thank you. Uh, Jess, it's about research in these settings. How, what is the role of research progressing or understanding of quality? Okay, I think is the, the top of, because if in, in my career, because I have two ones, right, in the field as a humanitarian aid worker and then as a professor, if you don't have a uh, paper uh, publish about something, it doesn't happen, okay? So when I went to, to Mozambique um, in, C in the Cyclone I, I do it this. I do it my work, but also I do the research, okay? So this is important because when I was in Mozambique, uh, I have a lot of people that went to the health center with some uh, dermatological thing, I never see that in my life and maybe well, I don't know what it is and I talk with colleagues and then I read a paper talking about Pelagra. So it's more or less common uh, after um, uh, a disaster and then I saw, well, I have an outbreak of Pelagra. Plague, you mean? Pelagra, uh, yes, plague. Yes. No, I, no, 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 Plagra, it's Pelagra. So. I don't know what to say in, uh, so give me a moment. Oh, apologies, Karen. No, 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 I think it's, I think it's Pelagra in... Uh, I don't know, I think so, anyway. It's... 
I think we'll probably work out the definition, but yes. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to I, know, I, I said the, the name in English to give me a one moment, but I think it's Pelagra also in English. Um, and then I publish a paper because it helps another doctor that faced this, this emergency, you know, because we have some, this is an example, because we have some diseases that we read in the books and uh, 20 years ago, and then it's only in the books. So, and another thing that I think it's important, and I think Juliet talked about a little about this, it's the indicators that you use in planning, right? And we do a lot of process indicators and not the outcomes. So we can do some research. We don't need big studies about case controls and that kind of things, but some cross-sectional uh, studies give a lot of things and make us to thought about that. Thank and you. I'm going to see what okay. you say, the plug in English. <laughs> Um, and Alpha and Juliet, you both, Alpha, you finished, you were talking about the importance of advocacy for standards as an advocacy tool. I'm uh, interested no, to it's, see it's what's your perspective the on the, um, the role of donors in, in pushing to uphold uh, quality standards. How can we as operational actors or actors that are looking at the performance of a system, what role do we see the standards have in advocacy with donors? Thank you, Jess. Donors. And our funding partners, our resources, and those who provide us our resources to act should first be with us and stand with us when we, in, in areas that we try to improve our work. Quality is one of them. We always talk about one other area, preparedness, and keeping the quality of our work are areas that donors would first need to stand with us in, in our ambition. To, to keep the quality at the center of our work despite the ever-changing, ever-challenging environment around us. First, they will need to support the work that we invest on quality. I think that's what they can do first, because they all want quality. I've never seen a donor who wants their money be spent in or without quality, or no one wants their money to be wasted, or say we don't share any report we don't okay you just they all want quality communities we serve deserve quality and want quality so donors should stand with us in in the work and the future uh challenges is about funding as well it's one challenge that we will always have while decreasing funding is is, is an evident uh reality of our today's work how do we uh, keep the quality in, in our work, right? In Syria, for example, we're challenged because of the, all the geopolitical new crises around the world is just reducing the funding in our next door crisis, which is Syria. Now all the humanitarian actors are challenged with difficult decisions to reduce the, the food process, for example, that they serve. Okay, this will cause us not to meet the minimum uh, calorie that we need to provide per person, which is 2000 plus that we need to serve but including big actors from UN agencies like World Food Programme and all actors serving in food sector are now with this difficult situation. Donors are even challenging us while we expect them to support us in, in our work to be stay in quality. They're challenging us with new rules and targeting uh, work that we need to do spend their money in the best way that they think it's the best way, not the communities often. Mm. So from donors' perspective, that's, I think they will need to bear with us, stand with us in the challenging uh, situation that we think will not improve anytime soon. So the best thing they can do is understand us and support us. Do you want to come in on that, Julia? So... No. <laughs> On the role of donors, yeah. um, 
Yeah. <laughs> the, actually, those responses have now made me think of about 10 other things as well that I hadn't thought of before, which is also really useful. I think the role of donors is really interesting. Often when um, we speak to donors, what we're finding is they're asking us for evidence or guidance or whatever in order to help furnish them with the arguments they need within their own uh, bureaucratic structures. Um, and I think in that regard, uh, you know, standards established um, norms and expectations based on uh, extensive consultation is a very powerful tool for them to be able to leverage change within their own um, organizations and, and governments, which is really important. I think the donors are also really important in setting incentive structures within the sector, but also promoting um, cultures and expectations where they can around the importance of things like standards. And I think one of the things that struck me just, I was listening to Fan, is, um, is around that need, and it was not also a comment that William made about um, principles, humanitarian principles, that was another one. Um, what we found with humanitarian principles is two things. One is that organizations are not prepared to be sufficiently transparent about the extent to which they are um, able to achieve one, you know, not achieve, but you know, uh, be, comply with uh, principles. There is a lack of transparency across the sector, which means we don't really know what we're talking about. And the second thing is, organizations are not good at providing the pragmatic and practical tools to help provide the frameworks for judgment that operational uh, management and leadership need to make, often on a daily basis. So those are two significant gaps, and I'm not suggesting standards on principles, but the, the same is also true for, for standards. In the first three to six months of an emergency, we found that most operational humanitarians don't read anything. So there's no point bringing new stuff <laughs> to very busy people who are embracing a lot of their, their decisions on uh, instinct and a few trusted advisors. And standards are also important for um, feeding that into the, the lifespan of humanitarians. Most humanitarians, when they come into the sector, you know, largely don't leave the sector. They are building knowledge over a 25 to 30 year time frame, and also the um, sources that they're exposed to in their early stages of the career will often be the same sources that they refer to throughout their career. So actually the longevity and stability of a standard like Sphere or any of the others is in itself important because it takes a long time for people to absorb and be able to contextualize and utilize that. Now, why was I linking this back to donors? Um, <laughs> I can't remember, but it, was, it made me think of lots of other things. Well, that's quite all right because you've given me a beautiful segue. Um, you say most people come in, they start their career, and have maybe 20, 25 years kind of ahead of them in the humanitarian sector. And most of our panel here have got that already in the bag. Uh, but I'd like you to think about, well, what does that future look like for those people coming in now in the next 20 years? What is the role of quality and well, standards within the system? What's it going to look like? Does it have a very active role? So that's my uh, final question to the panelists. Uh, what does the future of quality look like? Uh, and who would like to kick us off? I'll, I'll go to Alpha. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. First, I should say the future looks no easier for those who are just joining the humanitarian sector or <clears throat> in the room. There are thousands of years of experience, right? If we add all the experiences in the room, but we can see today the reality. While we talk about quality, let's talk about the reality as well. The future is, is no easier, will not be easier. There will be <clears throat> even more challenging situations that we will face. There will be more violations of IHL. There will be more access situation. Funding will continue to be less. Crisis will increase. So it will not be easy. Let's accept that and try to work around this or on, on this. I think in the future, two things that the humanitarian sector, humanitarian actors should not compromise, and I think it will remain at the center of our work. Do no harm. We will always continue to try and not harm the communities we serve. And second is uh, to protect the dignity. So dignity should always stay at the center. But of course the standards and the way we work with one another will need to change and we will need to adjust. We talk about many issues that we did not discuss last decade. The climate is now an issue that we talk a lot. <clears throat> Technological developments. Now this year, something is going crazy, which is artificial intelligence. 
we'll see what it will bring to our lives. So I don't know what really we will face uh, next year, because we, we could see that 24 will be a year that the AI is going crazy. Uh, so there are many new things, and we will need to adjust our work and standards and the way we work according to, to that. But what I want to say is, is in this ever-challenging environment that we can see ahead of us, standards and the quality are one of one elements that unites us as humanitarian sector. We will need more uh, connections or issues that unites us because more challenges will, will try to crash, crack and dissemble us in, in the, as a sector. And I think as we have more issues and areas that unites us, uh, we will be more resilient to the future shocks that we will have ahead of us. And as an organization, we all have responsibility. Turkish Red Crescent engaging my organization, engaging actively, closely with humanitarian standards, being a member of Sphere, being a member of many other uh, networks that works on quality, is a responsibility. In our own domestic context, in our countries, we need to try and promote and have more actors try to work in quality. There will always be those who don't prefer to do so, but let's hope we increase the number of humanitarian actors who work in quality. I already see in the room many faces that we work together in, in Turkey on, on sphere and quality standards. I see NGOs and partners here who promote that and many probably are online. And we initiated a sphere project in Turkey uh, recently to just exactly to do this, to increase the number of humanitarian actors who choose to work in quality. This is what I want to say. Future will not be easy, but quality and the standards we have will be one strong element that unites us for future shocks to be resilient. Thank you, Alpha. Thank you. Vanda, same question. Yeah, thank you. Echoing uh, what Alpha mentioned, um, I think a, we really need to shift the power. I think I, I look um, in the future that <coughs> shifting power for more and more a uh, um, what you call it, buy-in from the national civil society, but also uh, mutually reinforced convening power from the national government in the sense of really uh, using the, uh, the standard. Uh, Alper mentioned about digitalization. I think moving forward in the future, innovation become very important. Uh, you mentioned about AI, but also nowadays we know that there are different uh, technology being, being, uh, uh, being shared. Even in the marketplace uh, during this HNPW, we can see different um, kind of like uh, innovation that being, 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 being shared for the, for the sector. Uh, I really would like to bring uh, also and uh, see more on the young professional, like the young humanitarian who get more buy-in on the importance of the humanitarian standard, which is linked what Anna mentioned, the importance of bringing the university and Felicity and Sphere Secretariat is really uh, also promote bringing in um, university in uh, you know promoting the the Sphere standard, um, and I think yeah the the. The last one is continue to, uh, you know, looking more and more how the participation of the people that we serve in really, uh, you know, they, 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 they know that uh, uh, all the, the standard is basically to serve, uh, making sure that they've been uh, treated with, with dignity. And um, for Plan International, as an organization, we continue to commit in using the standard in our humanitarian work. Globally, we are present in 85 countries, uh, but we also would like to continue bringing the gender equality and social inclusion um, you know, lens uh, when we are uh, implementing and use the standard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Landa. So, uh, I have to say one thing, Palagra is the same in Portuguese in English. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yes, I think that uh, I saw the things very well in my view about humanitarian aid in the next years because I saw that many universities, many organizations have a lot of courses, so Almost the people don't go to the field without any course before. So um, I think this is a change, right? <coughs> I think that is a big change. And it's not 
it's it's not difficult to bring this topic to the to the university. Okay, I'm not an example because I'm a huge fan of spheres, so, and I'm very persuasive uh, human in my university, but. All the people can go to university and say, well, can I give a pilot class? I do it the same in my university and I do it the class to the students and then they, they, they made this evaluation and they want more. And now I have a five day course in my university and three day of sphere. So it's, I think it's a huge shift that we saw with so many courses. Thank you, Anna. Juliet, what's the long view for quality? So, um, yeah, I mean, firstly, 10 years in the, <laughs> in the humanitarian sector actually isn't very long or so. I mean, the humanitarian sector is improving, but it's um, slow and incremental. And actually, uh, we did a comparative piece between the learning coming out of um, the Kosovo evaluations 20 years before the Ukraine one, um, and it showed like some really stark differences, like mobile technology, for example, was barely there you know, 20 years before. But actually, the fundamental lessons that the sector was struggling to learn have been quite comparable, like the, you know, the race for national partners and those sorts of elements. Are actually so 10 years isn't very long but i think also and this is only a new thought um is uh, for me is um also it depends very much what the emergencies are that the sector has to grapple with in the next 10 years because those those um new crises or significant crises are really pivotal and important learning moments within the humanitarian sector which tend to accelerate or you know direct a lot of the learning but i'd say Given that, I think there are two main challenges that um, we're sort of at a junction on two issues. One is our definition of humanitarian. So at the moment, we can see the sector kind of dividing itself. One, uh, shifting away with the, the um, funding gap, looking at a more um, traditional or narrow definition of humanitarian. Now, if the sector moves in that direction, the sphere standards and those sorts of standards set by the humanitarian for the sector for the sector will remain very core. If it goes the other way, which is the more nexus -y approach where we're being pushed quite rightly or challenged to work more effectively with other systems, actually that calls into question how um, exclusively humanitarian our language expectations and standard setting is by ourselves for ourselves and the extent to which that enables or can accommodate or can translate across into meaningful relationships with the other systems that we might want to work with more the development and peace builders as well as many others and I think that will be a real challenge do we sit do we continue to sit as quite an introspective slightly isolated sector or do we actually manage to integrate more meaningfully with others working in humanitarian context and what does that imply for um, our expectation around standards and language the other is around localization which we would say has been at a tipping point for a while and yet not quite tipping um, and we may stay there for another 10 years or there may be some meaningful shifts and I think this also has a big implication for that whole issue around contextualization we are giving insufficient space for judgment and contextualization um, at, at the more pro project and national levels within our within our sector and until that changes or shifts in a meaningful way we will not be applying the standards in the way in which they're intended and that comes along with all the real power shifts that would be required to do that but also this recognition of the need to shift the business model we always say that you know you can put flexible funding into the humanitarian business model and it still comes out as restricted because that's how we're built and the same goes for i think the application of standards you can put intentionally very flexible standards into a very fixed system and they will be applied in a fixed blanket way and um i think that is another kind of cruxy issue for standards thank you william would you like to come in on this one in the future Thank you. Yeah. And as I said before, I do think it's going to get a whole lot worse due to the contextual challenges. So that's why I think we really need to get our house in order. We need to know what the concepts mean. We need to have the same language and appreciate, for example, on the principles that, that 
for example, a, a frontline aid worker is able to talk about independence and neutrality, able to talk about um, the compromises with the capital base, and the capital is able to talk about with the head office. So I think, I think getting onto the same page is really important because it's going to get harder. And I think I'm just reflecting as well, um, just on AAP and accountability and bringing in um, a question that's come in online. They're asking about, are there any um, professional standards in human resources? So when Sphere started around 94 to 97, um, there were also a couple of other agencies called HAP, Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, and People in Aid. And they merged to become what's now known as the CHS Alliance. So yeah, so for that, for that question online, do, do look at um, the CHS, the Core Humanitarian Standard, and be in contact with the Alliance. But there's a question about how we act. There's a question about character, and as Juliet said, about culture. And the more we drive around in big four-wheel drive vehicles, which are brand new, and we pitch up in air-conditioned cars, and have fridges in the back where we pop open a coat after having a meeting with the community, the less we are conveying dignity and the less we will ever be on the same page. I remember when I was in Afghanistan, we, we drove around in really beat up cars in Kabul for security reasons. But when we, and we're helicoptered into Bamiyan, but then driving out into the central highlands, we were always in appropriate vehicles and we never pitched up um, and then in a brand new Land Cruiser, and then the driver sitting you know, on the edge, cleaning the car or something, um, and just having loud music and sipping or smoking or whatever. But, but, but just these little details mean so much when you've lost everything, when you're in shock, when you're in grief, or when you're in a prolonged chronic case of vulnerability. Um, what, what's the difference? Well, it's a huge difference if someone is appearing in a vehicle or something and having a conversation where you can properly sit down or appearing in a brand new vehicle that's just way beyond and out of their world and then just disappearing off as quickly as possible. So it's a, it's a minor point, but it, I think it's a really important point that we, that we have to reflect on what we spend our money on. And that has a trickle down and a knock on effect in, in accountability. And we bring up accountability and we say, you know, we're gonna do all this, we're gonna do all that. But actually, if you're not getting some things right, so modeling comes in, um, modeling and coaching and, and going out and meeting with the communities with, with um, more junior, if I can say that word, staff and showing them this is how you interact, this is how you convey dignity. Anyway, so I'll, I'll stop there, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions uh, from the audience. Great, some hands up there. I'll take the two, three. Um, let's go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what I, I wonder the whole time is what can the organi organization in themselves can change? You talked about bureaucracy of the donors, you talked about bureaucracy in the countries, but I had to struggle a lot with the bureaucracy in my organization. And um, that costs a hell lot of money. And sorry, I'm a medical doctor. I worked in Yemen as well. And if I can't provide uh, 1,500 calories for my patients because the big bureaucracy and people on higher levels um, make their decisions in the way they do. That kind of make me not driving around in the uh, shiny vehicles, but being on spot. And um, I don't see that I can change a lot at that point, but maybe people in other higher levels can change something. Great challenge, thank you. I think we had one and two. <laughs> Yes, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, great. So I'm Francois Bayon, I'm the managing director of uh, IHIP, which is a small NGO working on construction contract for the humanitarian sector, which are standards, but they are particular because it's a bridge with the humanitarian sector and the private sector. So this is where there is a, a bit of a discussion and room for uh, contextualization. And I just wanted to share a few well, options that may be of interest. In this kind of tools, um, the contracts are separated in two general kind of documents. One are general conditions and the other one are called particular conditions. And uh, the particular conditions are a space uh, actually to have uh, the guidance and uh, the mechanism, the general mechanism adapted and being, you can use the word localized or contextualized 
uh, to match the context and the projects, and it's a result of the discussion with the non-humanitarian sector, which are usually, uh, in that case, construction people, contractors. And uh, in this environment, there's also a lot of uh, uh, discussion about quality management systems, and quality management systems, when you talk about quality for engineers, they have a very, like, uh, well, they have a vision of what it is, and it doesn't really always match what the quality expectations are in terms of indicators from the humanitarian sector. So IHIP is also part of the AQA mechanism, which is a WASH system on the assurance and quality uh, uh, accountability. And uh, I'm just saying, advocating for a kind of a, a bit of a space that exists there using particular conditions, which is the result of a dialogue between local actors and humanitarian actors, and yeah happy to share notes if that's of interest. But my question is, is this already in place to some extent in your standard, maybe in the sphere standard? Is, this, is there a culture of this already? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alan Kalmo with the Lutheran World Federation. Um, actually, what Juliet said struck me a little bit because I was in this humanitarian diplomacy session yesterday. And one of the things that, you know, because of, you know, we're dealing with a lot of non-state actors, de facto governments, uh, governments which are very restrictive, we need a lot more of this diplomacy and negotiations happening and we as humanitarians are not equipped to do that. So we hand over the negotiations and the diplomacy to other people, member states, uh, maybe high-ranking UN officials. I think my question is, and, and this goes to what you're saying about we keep our standards to ourselves and you know that question from from the gentleman is the same like you know how do we how are our standards being interpreted by other sectors outside of the humanitarian sector those people who are negotiating for us do they understand what we mean by quality because afghanistan comes to mind where you know we are able to access uh, and negotiate access, but we don't have access to women. And for us in Afghanistan, not having access to women and not having staff, women staff work for us is actually a life-saving issue. It's more than just a quality issue. So how do we make sure or do, do we have any mechanisms in place to ensure that those who you know, negotiate for us actually understand what we mean? And then the second part is, it's, it's interesting. I, I attended the session because it's fear um, primarily. But number two, um, because it's an issue of quality, in my head, why are we even discussing this? As you know, as, uh, as our colleague Panos was saying, you know, who doesn't want quality? You know, like why do we even have to discuss it? The reason why we're discussing it is because there's a lot of push to actually compromise on quality. You know, just this push on, okay, we don't have enough, more, enough money in the humanitarian sector, let's go for life-saving. And what do they mean when they say life-saving? food, non-food items, anything which you can distribute and do within 30 days, because that's what they want to do sometimes, and that's easy, that's you know, um, not problematic. Because our minimum standards are being challenged. You know, whenever we deal with governments, for example, we say, okay, we need to give this much to people, and then they say, yeah, but you can't. Okay, then maybe we can give this much. Um, no, but you still can't because, you know, you have to go there. Okay, we agree to that. So how much do we actually give up on standards because we wanted access. I think there has to be a discussion on quality and access and what do we really, when do we really say no to? Um, and people, another session on AAP yesterday, they were saying that when you talk to communities, most of the time they say, well, they don't think in sectors, right? Um, communities, most of the time, they don't think in sectors. Unless they're a professional community who has been supported by NGOs a lot, then they think in, in sectors. So considering they don't think in sectors, when you ask them, was that support relevant to you? Most of the time, well, it was nice to have, but it wasn't really what I needed. Because what they needed was very specific, let's say their family. What I need may not be the same as what my neighbor needs. Well, sometimes even my family, what my, I need, my brother may not need. So, but because our system, as Juliet said, is, is fixed into something which we can scale up very quickly, this doesn't work. Um, and we don't learn because we don't share information. Why don't we share information? Because we don't trust each other and because we are fearful that we will be judged, that our funding will be reduced so that we don't learn. So I think the next question would be, is there still a way to fix this trust deficit that we have in the sector? Because unless we start trusting each other, um, there won't be any change. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm going to pause because that's quite a lot of meaty questions and I think hopefully we'll have time for a second round. So we've got issues of bureaucracy. Are we too bureaucratic in the humanitarian sector? Surely not. Um, the private sector in relationship with local private sector actors, but maybe also, you know, we all see Amazon coming into this space. You know, what's the role of quality of actors like that in the private sector too? Diplomacy, access, competition and trust. So just some small issues there from my panel. Uh, who would like to pick that up? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe just to pick up on the trust thing, because I think that's I think that's massive, and the the trust deficit um, as. Um, in terms of compromising both our effectiveness and our ability to learn and improve, I think is really significant. And I don't, I don't know quite how to fix it, but it is, a, it is a word that comes up again and again and again, because we're building in so many inefficiencies to protect our individual organizational interests that it's really compromising our collective action for definite, definite. But I think there's two things. Um, oh, I'm not sure if this is a very ALNAP thing to say, but I would say bold leadership. Bold leadership, particularly in this next two or three years, where I suspect that the funding gap is going to cause organizations to retrench and go into a much more organizationally self-protective environment. Like the leadership is going to be more concerned about the survival of their organization and the protection of their kind of niche and positioning within the sector than they are, uh, uh, they won't feel confident and comfortable enough to take the decisions that actually would enable the kind of trust element to to grow and the other is to increase and diversify these safe learning spaces the the lack of space to have honest open reflective learning conversations is like a little bit shocking now i sit with, i used to be in operations and now i sit within hell now it's like oh it wasn't just me then you know i was talking to three country directors the other week all of whom said they do not say, share their best learning with their peer organizations because it would compromise their competitive positioning for donor funds it's like that is awful and they you know and that's that's true everybody who knows knows it's true and we've all experienced it um, and i think that those are two really fundamental things um that can that can happen to to shift that trust conversation me to just maybe complement a bit on the trust and the access because this is all in my day-to-day -day work and on the front line as practitioner organizations and people in the room I think partnerships and trust will take us forward in this challenging environment and while that's why I was expressing a bit connecting this quality to, to our unity because it's a strong element I see that unites us. Context specific challenges that we face, for example in Syria, just one example, when you have this non-state armed groups bringing issues to you that requires compromises while donors are here are pushing you for something else, I think often we will, in the future as well, need to adopt our joint operating principles as the sector. That's what we did, for example, in North, uh, Northern Syria. Donors were saying this, non-state armed groups all require compromises and away from realities, away from principles. I think the number of cases that we will need to agree among ourselves, context-specific joint operating principles, looking at all, of course, universally agreed standards will increase. Nothing that we set in one location can be universal in terms of the, the standards, the plans, and this will increase. It's important that we stay united, and the more actors are in this partnership, are in this coordination, in this unity, I think the more success is there for us. Otherwise, the number of cases that we fear, fail Will, will increase because one acting differently when it when we are all on the ground has an impact on all of us so and we will need to face with these realities but try to bring more people into the the, the partnership thank you thank you alpha Anna. i i think that they tell everything um about bureaucracy and trusts maybe i can talk uh, after the session, <laughs> because I was a humanitarian director of Doctors of Old, and we can talk about NGOs, uh, but I'm here as a professor, so I think you can bring also this topic to the courses that we made, right? 
what is a leadership uh, and not a director, uh, what is the trust. I think we can bring all these topics to the universities because they are the frontline actors. Anna Vanda. Yeah, uh, very quickly, I think evidence has become important. I mean, uh, Juliet mentioned a lot about how we documented the, uh, you know, the, the how success or what is the add value of, you know, using the standard. Because I think some of the evidence is uh, not, not so many, right? So we need to kind of like having that uh, properly and can be accessed. I think on the diplomacy is not always easy. I mean, uh, depend also to whom and what level that we are we are engaged. But I always believe that um, preparedness is also important. How we continue, you know, uh, bring the discussion prior to the uh, to the emergency uh, context, and using the cluster, using the different uh, coordination uh, platform that exists in country, that might also help. It might not answer everything but at least there is an effort that been uh, been been done um, and yeah i think just fostering collaboration because this is not only one organization or two organization or one sector but disaster is everybody business no what they said so we know we don't we will not give up alper <laughs> because we are stronger together so yeah thank you very much thank you Amanda. william would you like to thank you very much yeah, just to, just to conclude, and thank you very much for being here and your questions as well, your participation. And we'll keep talking about the, the question on shelter as well. Um, but to say that Sphere is not just a handbook. It is a handbook, but it's not at all just a handbook. It, it is actually people. It's a, it's a network of champions. And Sphere has focal points and trainers who are passionate volunteers. Some trainers are not volunteers, but passionate volunteers promoting the book because the book otherwise would just be left on a shelf and and without it being in the hands of those who can train others it's useless so yeah a big shout out to felicity and her team who are supporting the learning aspect of sphere and i think it's really important as well just to say at the end just to remind you that sphere the core humanitarian standard the other standards in the partnership child protection for example and INEE the new one is being launched this afternoon they're not a threat they're not there to hurt you they're there to support us come back to that competition point we're trying to support each other so yeah um humanitarian standards partnership big them up we're going to harmonize we're going to simplify where we can and we're going to try and get our house in order thank you <laughs> Thank you so much. I really apologize. I apologize uh, kind of second round. We ran out of time. I know we have to finish at 9.30. Um, it's, it's a luxury to be the chair because I don't have to try and answer these tricky questions, but I do think I need to try and summarize a little bit what we heard. Um, and what I heard loud and clear was that quality still is of critical importance to humanitarian assistance now, and it will be in the future. But we do have to be not naive in that, and we have to really grapple some of these really big ethical challenges. I heard very strongly the importance of dignity, the quality equates to dignity. And if we're working in the humanitarian space, then we should all be committed to that. I heard a very strong call for the importance of contextualization and looking at the local relevance and the learning and listening and local leadership to make sure the standards are, are fit for purpose. Um, and then finally, well, not finally, we covered a lot of things, um, but we, Alpa gave a really lovely kind of wrap up that the importance of the, of the quality standards and the minimum standards is that that's something that unites us all. There's too much competition in our space. There's too much that divides us, whereas an agreement on humanitarian principles and quality is so critical to now and the future, and it unites us. So we should take away that, that, that by really investing in these and navigating through these ethical challenges, we'll be a stronger humanitarian community. So I want to thank our excellent panelists for a really great discussion and, and the audience, both online and in the room, for joining us and asking your questions. Thank you. Thank you.